For decades, the Motor Racing Network has told you the story on the racetrack. Hale's in the grass. Hale loses it. He tries to pull it back. Down he's side by side. They make contact. Both head toward the wall. But more often than not, that's only half the story. Now, we're pulling back the curtain on all those tall tales both in and out of the garage. The whole situation between uh, Hale and Donnie was simply, if I can't win it, I'm going to make sure you don't. Stories the newer fans have never heard, and the older ones just can't get enough of. When that right cross gets that jaw it's over. <laughs> we're sending you into another MRN tailspin. Trouble and turn five. Now, here's your host, Alex Hayden. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another edition of Tailspin. I'm Alex Hayden. So glad you can join us as we now begin to sit down and learn some more about the best days of NASCAR racing that have ever happened. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and introduce you to the panel of our guests, certainly the longtime legendary voices of the Motor Racing Network. Barney Hall is alongside. We've got Jim Phillips to the far side of us. And in the middle, the man on the hot seat, as always here on Tailspin, our special guest, NASCAR Hall of Famer, the Iron Man, Jack Ingram. Jack, welcome, and uh, are you sure you wanted to get involved in this thing? <laughs> sure, thanks a lot. <laughs> Well, let, let's start off. Uh, Iron Man, that's the name that, that uh, you've been called for so many years. Where did the nickname come from, and did you find yourself having pressure to live up to that nickname, Iron Man? No, that uh, that started uh, probably the now to Asheville Speedway. Uh, he would call, he had ever had a name for everybody, and he called me Arm and Hammer Man. <laughs> it sounded like Iron Man, I guess, to some people. But anyway, I went, uh, I ran uh, in 73, I ran about 1,750 laps, five different states and six six races. Seven, 1,750 laps, a lot of laps, plus practice. When uh, next week I started reading, it's talking about what the Iron Man did. And so that actually come from a guy at uh, Asheville Speedway. That's, uh, yes, it was uh, that Arm and Hammer Man mm-hmm. uh, sounded like Iron Man to a lot of people. Let's, uh, how did you get started in racing? Uh, was it as a fan or uh, going to the races with someone else, or how did you get started? I volunteered to work at a race shop in Asheville mm-hmm. when I was about 15. A guy named Toy Jones owned it, and he bought a race car from a guy in South Florida. Banjo delivered it, and he had an old payphone. We're talking about and Banjo Matthews, right? Banjo Matthews. Right. He went to the payphone said i like this car I said would you sell me that truck he said yeah I said how you want to get banjo back down there he said don't send him back i don't want him <laughs> <laughs> and the rest as they say is, is history yeah. on that so uh, in those early days when you first started getting behind the wheel of these race cars did you know immediately said you know what I- i'm pretty doggone good at this or was that something that you just kind of did on a whim and thought well i'm i'm decent let's see where this takes me well, I volunteered to work on race cars for 10 years before I actually had one. And I uh, was racing at Asheville Speedway, and there's a, a good short track racer there named Ralph Earnhardt. Didn't talk to anybody, and why he talked to me, I'll never know. He said, boy, if you quit driving that car faster than you could drive it, you'd do all right. <laughs> <clears throat> and that night, the first time I finished, finished seventh or eighth out of about 10 cars left, so I thought I done beat the world down. <laughs> but uh, I'll never forget uh, Ralph. Uh, I don't know why he did that because he wouldn't hardly talk to anybody. Not a bad name, uh, yeah. that Earnhardt name at all, to, to <laughs> step up and, for whatever reason, befriend you. Now, was this on dirt or asphalt? Asphalt. I wasn't much, for, much in dirt. Uh, matter of fact, I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't think there's much, much future in it anyway. Was, uh, was Hickory a dirt track then when, when you started? When I, when I started, yes. What did you race on it? I raced on it one time and, uh, when it's dirt. How'd that go? I don't know. I was driving a car for Elmo Langley, and he made me park it. <laughs> <laughs> Why in the world would he make you park the race? Well, car? That's, just, that's just the way they done back then. They'd fill the field up starting parks. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I caught uh, Elmo and was going to fix and pass him, and he. His crew chief hanging out a sign and park that car. <laughs> <laughs> park number, whatever number was park it. Barney, uh, your early recollections uh, of Jack Ingram, what was he like to you? 
Jack was a, a complete racer. I mean, he came to the racetrack to win, and, and, and it usually worked for him. He had really good help on pit road always. Uh, he told it like it was. A lot of guys didn't like Jack's style of driving and whatever, but uh, it, it was successful. I don't care where it were. You were kind of turning people around or whether they were bumping you or whatever. You just kind of let it go with the flow. Whatever, whatever was happening at the time, you just fell right in there. Well, when I started racing, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, fighting going on, <laughs> and that's the only way you get respect. You couldn't get it on the racetrack, so when the race was over, they was they had a grand national race at Asheville one night, and they, Soapy Castle said, where do they start these fights? I said, about anywhere here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're saying you had to fight some? You, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> And they started finding finding us for it, and we had to quit it. <laughs> well, how did you do as a fighter? Uh, I done uh, better than that. I did drive. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anybody at any of these race tracks that you thought, yeah, I can beat him in, on the race track in the race car, but to come back and say, okay, when I get out of the race car. I'm going to have to beat him a second time. Was there anybody that you thought, man, well, I, you, I don't want to ba battle this guy again? Actually, no. Uh, I, I, I don't think the size of somebody or whatever made any difference to me, but that was early on in my career. But uh, all them old Friday and Saturday night races back in them days, there was a lot of that went on anyway. Tell me about uh, uh, the sportsman, Na NASCAR late model sportsman, was how you started at, or where you made a name for yourself. How did you get started running for the championship? <clears throat> I finished uh, fourth in the national championship in '71 and didn't didn't really try. Red Farmer won '71. Uh, Moses. That was his third. <laughs> yeah, that was his third one. That was his third one. And I told Red, I think that uh, I'll just run for that championship. I finished fourth and didn't even go to all the races. He said, "Well, I'm out of here because there ain't no way I can beat you." I said, "You you win it if you don't crash and burn every week, and you ain't gonna do that." So, uh, the first year you won was 72. Yes. Okay, how many races did you have, to, uh, and how many different race tracks and races did you run that year? You remember? Yeah, uh, we ran on 28 different NASCAR tracks, uh, started 84 point races, and uh, accumulated the most points in one season anybody in the history of NASCAR in 1983. Uh, you, you actually won five championships, uh, three sportsman championships, and, and two Bush of Grand They finally cut the schedule down to where a man could uh, make make it some money and not have to go to so many tracks, right? That's just like a vacation to me. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to race much. <laughs> well, when you uh, and and the racing for you started at Riverside, right? Just like everybody else, like the. the no, the actually, uh, the first championship race I was in and intended on running the championship was in December, early December 71 at Texas World Speedway. First time on a speedway, Bobby Allison won and I was second. What was it like being basically a short track racer and then suddenly, yeah, you want to climb the ladder because there's more money involved. That's that's a better lifestyle, obviously, for everybody. That's more food on the table, et cetera. But what's it like for a short track racer to say, okay, we're going to Texas World Speedway, an ultra-fast, very big racetrack. How difficult was that transition? That's about the easiest thing I've ever done in my life in racing at speedways. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, it really nothing to it. If that, if that car run, it's just sit there and drive. It really is not... I know LD and I was down there at Daytona one time side we'd draft each other. We'd kind of afraid the rest of them. And we went out there and qualified about 174 or 5, and we was a drafting just he and I, and run 185. And at that time, there nobody run that fast with that kind of 68 Chevelle. But I, the first time I went to Daytona, David Pearson, a good friend of mine, and he, I went to him and asked him, uh, I'm going to get ready to practice it. What should I do? He said, just warm a motor up and go out on the racetrack, and you leave it wide open until you get ready to come back in the pits. 
And I come back in the pit, and Bill Seifert on the car, and he's sitting on them all white. And he said, let me tell you something. You're going to kill yourself and tear my car up. I said, Bill, I've run down interstates faster than this. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's the way it felt. It didn't feel like no speed to me. Uh, the most speed I ever felt was at Nashville Fairground Speedway when it was banked 36 degrees. That was speed. 128 miles an hour average qualifying on a 5 8 mile racetrack. The car didn't even have spoilers on there, nothing. Insane. It, it, it just, it's mind-boggling to wrap uh, y- the way people raced and what you did. Because, uh, I mean, quite frankly, nobody really knew any different as far as the safety aspect of it or even really how much a spoiler could really come into play and help you with the handling of the car. Yeah, well, it's not, we was racing at Nashville, and we started using spoilers there even though we could have been using them before. But them little, them little third mile, flat half mile tracks didn't need one. But uh, that that made a big difference at Bristol and Nashville and, of course, the Speedways. But the Speedway, the first race I ran at Daytona, the, uh, the spoiler was only three inches high. I'll tell you a little story about uh, uh, drafting and, and a couple of things like that. Buddy Baker was one of the best in the business. Harry Hyde was his crew chief, and he had, they'd found out a little bit about how to, to massage these cars and pick up some speed by making him a whole lot slicker to run on the racetrack. Baker was complaining at Talladega one time about his ride a little bit uh, with Harry Hyde. He kept saying the thing that the car is loose, the car is loose. Baker said he went back in the garage area and he walked over to uh, Harry Hyde. He said, I was madder than the devil. And Harry said, what is it now? And he said, the the damn thing is still too loose. He said, it's just too loose. He, Harry told him to go out there and, and run two laps for me. He went out there and run hard, come back in, and he did everything he could to keep it out of the fence. It was on one side of the racetrack, and there was no control, couldn't do nothing with it. They got the car back on pit road, and he looked in the mirror as he wa- went back in the garage area, and he looked back, and Harry Hyde and those guys were looking at the car and laughing, and Buddy come back up there and told me, he said, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, he said, Harry is determined to run that damn car loose. And he said, I don't know what's wrong with it. Harry walked up about that time and he said, Baker, there ain't no spoiler on that car. And he said, now, you talking about loose? Damn it, that's loose. <laughs> <laughs> he did a hell of a deal that day to keep him crashing that car. Well, that, that's the way it was. They told him a lot of times yep. in the draft, was it, Jack? He was, he was experimenting a lot for you guys. Yeah, the biggest wreck I got into at Daytona was uh, in practice, uh, Michael Waltrip decided he would go out with his spoiler. Then they'd let you qualify the 10 degree spoiler if you wanted it or without it. But he, he didn't put enough spoiler on to go out and run 15 or 20 cars in a pack. And uh, he come off the second turn on the outside of me and left it wide open, drove into the side of him and wrecked about eight or nine cars, about as bad as you could wreck them. And, uh, Going into the turn, Donnie Allison waved me off, and I didn't, I didn't know what he was doing. But he was trying to tell me that Walter was fixing a wreck. So you, but like when he was drafting, uh, I know LD, uh, one of your competitors, he liked to run with the cup guys drafting, especially in practice. He said you could learn a lot. Did you agree with that? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but what did you think about when you went to Daytona for the uh, Permatex 300 back then, uh, e- even in Bush days and in the late model sportsman days, the cup guys would want to come out and race with you th- there when they wouldn't go to a lot of short tracks and take a lot of the first that maybe you could have won. Did you th- have any uh, feelings about that, or did you think anything about it, or is it, is it, do you like to race with them or what? I, li- I liked it, but it really, uh, if you had a decent car, it didn't matter who they were. Uh, Daytona was uh, to me pretty easy to, uh, like say David Pearson I got ready to start the race first time I was there and I said David what do you need to do he said well get in the outside lane and stay there it's hard to get off fourth turn if you're running low where that tunnel is bump and might spin out we was coming to get the white flag and I was running second to Bill Dennis and the motor blowed Bill's, uh, Bill Seifert's car and Bill Hunt, 
paid to have the motor rebuilt, and when they brought it to my brother Tom to have it fixed from blowing it up, Tom said, this ain't the motor that I fixed. Huh. So it was just an old junk short track motor, and it burnt, used so much oil, it burnt out of oil and blowed up. But you won You won twice at Daytona. You won, won once at the Chevrolet, and you won your last race at the Ford. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, tell us about the Ford deal. That's what I'm. Uh, I'm I remember that race. Uh, it, it's kind of odd that that you won the race in a Ford. Well, it was a fair because Chevrolet was a dominant. Uh, oh yeah. make uh, back then. It was a. It was a. Fair, Ford Fairmont, and them things didn't look like they'd make any kind of race car. But it was basically pretty narrow, wheels stuck out from underneath the fenders. <laughs> and uh, a little bit. qualified third and uh i kept thinking this ain't gonna be no, much of a problem win this race and uh harry was running in a pack of cars and just running talking about up, harry gant now harry gant and we i went up all just almost touched him and he looked over and i told him move down in front of me and uh we rocketed fast mark pace market he was uh leading in now, really, Dave Marcus had the car to beat that day, he, right? He had a uh, Leo Jackson, Richard Jackson car, and it was rocket fast. And uh, we come off the second turn about two laps later and caution lights on, and I got out past Harry, I got halfway by him, and here come Marcus on the inside. I run him down in the flat, and he backed off the throttle. <laughs> And he wound up hitting a car coming off fourth turn in the back end, and uh, I won. Harry was second. Har Harry Harry was uh, leading, and his crew had went to uh, that Wicked Circle, and I pulled in there, and, uh, and oh, <coughs> they won't know what what I was doing there. I said, "Well, I just come out here and aggravate you guys." <laughs> 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 They they really thought that since that caution's out and Harry was leading, and caution's out because of uh, somebody wrecked somewhere or done something. But anyway, to put the caution out, and that's the reason some uh, somebody blowed a motor. But anyway, anyway, uh, that's fun. But uh, one thing that uh, that you had to be efficient on, and and you had, you had to have help uh, back in those days. But you couldn't afford like a cup team. To hire just anybody you wanted to, so how did you run that many races and get the help to to like service your car when you went to the racetracks? Believe it or not, if I went way away from home, I'd uh, get volunteers. I got become to know people uh, around all over the country, and uh, I'd have two key people with me, and uh, we get two or three other guys, <laughs> and uh, most of them, all of them, would volunteer. They were racing uh at that racetrack at weekly events and uh they could jack a car and they couldn't they couldn't change tires but they could pour gas in and jack it up that's amazing uh of all your tracks and uh, your favorite short track and your favorite super speedway name them speedway it had to be daytona that's a mighty gratifying thing to win there coming down pit road uh after that race over, felt like you'd turned the big air conditioner on that side of that car. It was <laughs> really a good feeling. Uh, uh, Daytona, probably, I don't know, I, I liked a lot of short tracks, but probably Hickory. I, I did the best there with Ned Jarrett, the track operator. I won the track championship there twice. and It was a, it was a big name short race track. So uh, I did pretty well there, and I liked it awful well. It sure was unique, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Folks, this is a, another edition of Tailspin. Uh, if you have somebody that you want to have on the show that you may want to hear some stories about, maybe it's a favorite of yours, we have a new hotline that you can call at 844-4-ASK-MRN. Call that number, leave a message on there, and tell us who you would like to have on Tailspin to hear some more of these stories. So, uh, gentlemen, thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun. The legendary MRN announcers, Jim Chopper Phillips, Barney Hall, and the NASCAR Hall of Famer, the Iron Man, Jack Ingram. I'm Alex Hayden. Join us again on another edition of Tailspin.